You know, we live in a world of amazing communication options today, don't we? I mean, when you think about just, you know, 40, 50 years ago, what the main ways to communicate were versus the options that we have today, it's really amazing. You know, we live in a world today where, you know, you can email, you can call on a landline phone or a cell phone, you can tweet, you can post a message on uh, Facebook, Instagram, again, instantly communicating with people. Uh, you can visit with someone visually through a video call, through Skype or uh, FaceTime, Zoom, and things like that. You can text someone, fax someone, and if you absolutely have to, you can sit down and handwrite or type a letter and you can send it by snail mail. Now again, I mean, it's amazing when you think about it, because just 40, 50 years ago, the main ways of communicating with somebody over a long distance were a landline phone and a handwritten letter. And in just 40, 50 years, the uh, amazing ways we can communicate now instantly with people all across the world. I mean, let me ask you this question. Can you even remember the last time you received a handwritten letter? I'm, I'm not talking about a Christmas card or a little note where somebody jotted a few sentences. I'm talking about a multi-page handwritten letter. Can you even remember the last time you received one of those? Well, in the first century, there were mainly uh, two options for communica communicating with people over long distances. And that was a handwritten letter or a messenger. And usually those two, two things were combined into one. <laughs> But uh, as, as you think about that, we think about the New Testament. You know, 21 of the 27 books of the New Testament are letters. And tonight we're going to start the last main section of the Bible Project. And if you're kind of joining us here recently, the Bible Project has been a multi-year study that we've done through all of Scripture, from Gen Genesis all the way to Revelation. So we've worked our way ourselves up to the New Testament letters almost all the way through this entire study. But this last main section that we're going to start today, uh, we're going to call it Letters to the Churches. And to kick this section off, I, wanted, I want us to focus on how to read the New Testament letters well. So we're going to have sort of an introduction to reading the New Testament letters today. Now, a lot of Christians would probably say that one of the New Testament letters is one of their favorite books of the Bible. Uh, most teachers and, um, and preachers usually focus on the New Testament letters for their lessons and for their uh, sermon series and things like that. So I want to ask a question. You know, what is it about these letters that appeals to us so much? Well, I think it can be summed up really in one word. And that's relevancy. You know, the, the writers of the New Testament letters often seem to be writing directly to us. Now, obviously they weren't. They had a different audience. But it's like they're speaking directly to us because the issues that they're helping Christians deal with back in their day, in many cases, are the exact same issues that we have to deal with today. Uh, almost, you know, point for point. So you can kind of make a jump from their culture to our culture today and not have to do a lot of work because it's almost exactly the same issues that they're dealing with. Now, since most of us have written handwritten letters before, we may feel like we have a pretty good grasp on you know, what it takes, what's involved in, in, in writing a letter, or what, the, what would have been involved in writing a, a letter in the New Testament times, the first century world. But, you know, letter writing in the first century world was a lot more involved than we might think of today. You know, in the first century world, writing wasn't as easy or as common as it is right now. Um, you know, ancient cultures or cultures in the first century world were mainly oral cultures. So they, they shared everything verbally. Everything was communicated and shared verbally because a lot of the people in that time were illiterate. They, they couldn't read and write. They never learned how to do those things. So in an oral culture, everything is passed along verbally. Your history is passed along verbally. The stories of your family, knowledge about how to do a job, how to do practical things, was all passed from one generation to another verbally. And so people in those days were amazing at memorizing things. I mean, it's incredible when you look back 
and you see the amounts of information that people memorized in an oral culture or verbal culture. You know, we, we don't do much of that today because we live in a culture where we depend on written information or information uh, digitally stored on a computer that we can look back on and we can learn that way. But in an oral culture, you couldn't do that. You had to memorize what was told to you verbally. And so uh, that's the way it was, you know, in the first century world. Um, they didn't write a whole lot down because a good portion of the, of the uh, culture was illiterate. Another reason letter writing wasn't as common today, or wasn't as common then as it is today, is that materials were uh, expensive and they were, they were hard to come by. You know, it wasn't as easy as you and me going down to Walmart and buying uh, a ream of 24 pound paper and a pack of pens and just sitting down and writing anything we needed to write. Uh, letter writing in the first century could be a very costly investment. You know, for the most part, people would use papyrus, which was a, a paper-like material that was made from the stem of a plant. Uh, most first century letters were usually not anywhere near as long as the letters as we have in the New Testament. In fact, Philemon, which is the shortest letter that we have in the New Testament, would still have been longer than most letters written in that day. So when you wrote a longer letter like that, you had to you know, make the papyrus, and then you had to take those sheets of papyrus and glue them one end to the other, and then roll them up in a scroll to be able to contain everything that was uh, written in those New Testament letters because they were longer than most letters would have been. Another interesting thing about first century letter writing is that the person who was doing the actual writing of the letter was not, in many cases, the author of the letter. Um, you know, it was often done by a professional scribe. Um, that's why in the uh, New Testament letters we have references in several places uh, to people who did the writing down of what the author was telling them. Uh, an example of this would be a guy named Tertius. Uh, he's mentioned in the book of Romans. Of course, the book of Romans is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians who lived in Rome. Now, of course we know and we understand that Paul, who was inspired and guided by the Holy Spirit, was the author of the letters, of the words of that letter. Tertius wasn't the author of the letter. Paul was. But look at what the closing comments of the letter to the Romans says. It says, I, Tertius, the one writing this letter for Paul, send my greetings to as one of the Lord's followers. So again, the physical task of writing a letter back then is not as you know, easy as we may think of it. Uh, and this explains why they would use professional scribes. You know, scribes would cut their own papyrus paper. They would mix their own ink. They'd have to cut their own uh, reed pens and, and make those as well. And when they would be sitting there and, and getting, taking notes on what the uh, author of the letter had to say, they'd have this wax tablet that they used. They could quickly jot down the notes. And later they could go and sit down with a piece of papyrus and, and neatly uh, write out those notes that they had taken. Uh, and that's why people use scribes often, because they had the ability to write in the first case, where a lot of people couldn't write. They had the ability to write, and they had the ability to write neatly and small and make the most use of the limited space that was on a, a scroll. Uh, Randy Richards, in his book that he wrote on first century letter writing, he, met, he estimates that in today's dollars, so in today's money, because of its length, the book of 1 Corinthians would have cost about $2,100 for a professional scribe to write. $2,100 because of its length for a professional scribe to, uh, to write out the letter that Paul sent to the church in Corinth, that first letter he sent. Now, do I think that Paul and the church had to pay that kind of money for all the letters we have in the New Testament? No, I don't. Because I think they had people who became believers in Jesus who had that ability, who were professional scribes, like Tertius, the example we have in Romans, who said he was a follower of the Lord. And those people offered their services and their abilities uh, to help the church free of charge. I think, I think that happened 
in a lot of cases. So I don't think the church was having to shell out all this money because they wouldn't have had that kind of money uh, to do that. But like I said, as you, as you think about all that, it's a little more expensive and involved than you and I just running down to Walmart and getting the supplies we need, right? So the image that we may have of Paul or Peter or John, you know, just, you know, quickly sitting down and jotting out a letter in one day and sending it off and getting it to where it needs to go is probably not how it usually happened in the first century world. It was probably like these guys walking around a room thinking about what they needed to say, being guided by the Holy Spirit, and then sharing that with a scribe who would jot that down kind of on that wax tablet, taking notes, and then later go and write that out neatly on a papyrus scroll. Now, am I saying that Paul and those guys never wrote any of their own letters? No, I'm not saying that. But we know they did use scribes in this process. Uh, we're, we're told that specifically in Scripture. Now, what all this means is that a lot of care went into writing most of the New Testament letters. And not only did it involve valuable, valuable materials and significant cost to write them, it also took a lot more effort to deliver them than what we're used to. You know, when we uh, write a letter or type a letter, we throw it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, put it in the mailbox, and the post office comes, and they do the work from there. Well, they didn't have an, an organized postal service in the first century world like we do today. Letters had to be delivered in person, usually by someone who would have been really close to the author of that letter. And that person would go by foot or on a, a horseback or riding on a, or traveling on a boat and go the long distances it would have required traveling in that day to take a letter from one place to, to another and the amount of time it would have taken to do all that. So very different than from today. Also, most uh, written material in the first century was read out loud for the recipients instead of just being read privately. Again, the reason why this was required is that a lot of people couldn't read for themselves. Uh, you know, so they had to have someone else do that for them. So the image is the church, when this letter arrived from Paul or Peter or John, the church would get together and they'd gather together and that, that letter carrier or somebody else in the church who could read would take that and they'd read it out loud, the entire thing in one sitting for everybody to hear. Now all of this is, is kind of interesting to me when we think about the way we read the Bible today. You know, when we think about something like a Bible reading plan, a lot of you have used, probably used a Bible reading plan before. When we think about that, what we, what we imagine is that we take that Bible reading plan and we sit down by ourselves in a nice quiet place to, to do our Bible reading. You know, you have your time with the Lord in the morning or the evening where you find that nice quiet place where you can concentrate, you read the scriptures there uh, all alone uh, for the day. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. You know, I mean, we definitely need more people reading the Bible today, especially Christians. And we need to be doing things like Bible reading plans. But with individual reading alone, when we're just reading in isolation like that, the thing is we probably end up not discussing what we've read with anybody else. Uh, when we're reading on our own like that, we might, might misinterpret what we're reading or, or not understand it in the correct context uh, as we read on our own. And, and we kind of need that involvement of the church community to help in some of those areas. You know, most people in the first century church would not have had a personal copy of the scriptures. Again, it was an oral culture with high illiteracy rates and people couldn't afford uh, what it would have cost, cost to have their own copy of of these scrolls, these New Testament letters. So uh, reading the Bible in the first century was a community event. Now obviously, we're blessed to have access to the scriptures that we have today. You know, each of us able to have the scriptures in our own homes, with our own families that we can read and study from. Uh, we shouldn't take that 
for granted. You know, the opportunity to read, to think about, to learn from the Bible uh, like that whenever it's most convenient for us, I mean, that's, that's a great blessing. That's a great gift. And I think we're so used to it, we probably do take it for granted. But the thing is, we also need to be in community where we can read the scriptures with, with other believers because we learn so much from one another. You know, if, we, if we're reading and studying the scripture in community, in groups, within the church, you know, there are people who have insights that we won't have. There are people who will ask questions that we never think of. Uh, there are teachers or people with more knowledge than us from where they've been able to study the scriptures more than we have that can help us deal with the difficult passages and, and understand some of the confusing things that we can run into culturally as we read the Bible. We have accountability when it comes to reading and studying the Bible when we do it in community. You know, if we're just doing it on our own, we don't have that same accountability. When we're studying and reading the scriptures together in a group, we know that, you know, Joe and, and Sally and whoever else, we were all there together and we all acknowledge this is the truth of God. This is what God wants from us. What's what He desires for us. This is what Jesus desires for us. And then we leave that group and we go out into our jobs or, you know, the different things in our community and we can see each other and we can see, are we living that? And if we're not living that, we can go and talk to one another and say, hey, I just want to encourage you. Remember what Jesus said about this. Remember how Jesus said to, to handle this or how Jesus said to respond in this situation or how, what Jesus said about loving this kind of individual. And we can hold each other accountable where if we were just doing it all on our own, we wouldn't have that accountability. You know, the scriptures become so much deeper and richer and life-changing when we read and we study that in community with other Christians. And this is, this is one of the many reasons, it's not the only reason, it's one of the many reasons why part of my prayer life regularly, or recently that I've been praying a lot about and hoping for is that Christians who are not at great danger of dying from COVID will start coming back to in-person gatherings at the church again. Again, I'm not saying that people need to be foolish about this, especially if they're in a, in a category or have certain uh, vulnerabilities when it comes to COVID that's very dangerous for them. I'm talking Christians who are fall in a category that they stand little danger whatsoever if they caught COVID of something bad happening. And for them to start getting back into the habit of in-person uh, church again, in-person worship services and in-person Bible studies and, and coming to those things again. You know, online church and these online Bible studies that we've been doing, they have been a wonderful tool uh, to help get us through a really tough time in dealing with this virus around the entire world. But this is not a long-term solution. This is not a long-term answer when it comes to, the, to a, a local church. So I'm going to use Macedonia in this case. For the members of Macedonia, online church is not a long-term answer especially for those who are not at great risk of dying from COVID. We can't come become solely dependent on this. We need to be together for those reasons I just described, of the benefits of reading and studying Scripture together with other believers. Now, we're going to continue as a church to offer these online options because we've seen that you know, it's reached people who aren't already a part of our church. So it's, it's a great evangelistic way to reach others who don't know Jesus. So we're going to continue to provide this in the future. But again, I'm speaking specifically to members of Macedonia Christian Church. If you are not at great risk because of COVID, come back to the in-person gatherings again. Come back to the in-person worship services and the in-person Bible studies that we're having here because... We were never designed to be the church alone. We were never designed to be the church in isolation. We need each other. And, and, and more than just the reasons of the benefits of studying and reading Scripture together, there are so many other reasons that, that Scripture describes where we are, should be dependent 
on each other, and we can't do that in isolation. We've got to be together for that. Uh, so I just want to encourage you. It's not a huge guilt trip. I just want to encourage you. If you are not at danger, great risk and danger uh, because of COVID, please come back and join us at our in-person gatherings. Now, for the rest uh, of our time uh, for this study, I want you to watch Dr. George Guthrie. He's the professor of Bible at Union, Uni, uh, excuse me, Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, he's going to talk about some other key ideas and key, key points that we need to learn in order to read the New Testament letters well. Uh, so let's join him and, and see what he has to say. We want to talk in this eighth session about how to read the letters of the New Testament and then also how to read the book of Revelation. We're gonna accomplish all of this in just a few minutes <laughs> in this session. <laughs> Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to try to get oriented to how to read the letters well and give a brief introduction on how we begin thinking about Revelation. There's a couple of things that I see about the New Testament letters that I find uh, attracts people to them. One is the directness with which they address issues of real life. I think the moral exhortation in the New Testament letters is something that everybody can identify with because people haven't changed. We face the same temptations as people back then. Temptations to lust or anger or steal, all that stuff remains the same. So there's a certain directness that the letters uh, address issues of life. Is it fair to say that, that we are an extension of that church community in a sense? So we, we experience a lot of the dynamics in church that we find in the New Testament and those yeah, things being addressed. I believe that's a very good point because the letters convey what it's like to live as a Christian in church life. And so they address many of the same dynamics that way. So we hear them as, as direct and addressing issues that we're concerned about. Precisely, they, uh, they directly reach into the kinds of things that we're concerned about. And they're the main uh, kinds of literature that we have in the Bible that do that because the Gospels are the story of Christ and the Passion. We get the story of the early church in Acts. We get Revelation, but it's the epistles that show us, here's what it's like to live in Christian community. Here's what it's like to live real life day to day as a believer. One other thing I should mention that I think people find attractive about the letters is the fact that they interpret the life uh, and significance of Jesus. And so what, does, what is the meaning of Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and the newness of life that we now have in him? So the letters explain and unpack for us what, it, what the significance of Jesus was all about. So how do we read the letters of the New Testament well? How do we enter into the world of the letters? Well, number one, understand the historical situation or occasion of the letter. Many of our letters in the New Testament were written to address specific issues in the church. So we want to try to tune in to the occasion. Why was the letter written? What were the issues that were being addressed? Let me give you an example. The book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is a great example of uh, reading a letter in light of its occasion, the occasion for which it was written. Now, I think Galatians was written about 48 or 49 AD, so it's one of our earliest letters that we have in the New Testament. And Paul is dealing with a situation in the church that came up after the first missionary trip that you can find in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas had gone through this area that we uh, call Asia Minor, uh, modern day Turkey. They had gone through this area, had founded churches, preached the gospel of Christ. Many people had committed themselves to Jesus. And then after they left this group of churches in the southern part of Galatia, what happened was there were other teachers who came through and as they were interacting with the church, offering themselves as Christian teachers as well, things started happening. Maybe they um, were talking to a mom who had had a child in the past couple of months 
and they said to that mom, well, you have had your child circumcised, right? Silence. Paul didn't tell you about circumcision? Maybe they went over to somebody's house for lunch and they were serving ham sandwiches. And this person said, did Paul not teach you about the food laws in the Old Testament? You can't be a follower of God. You can't follow Jesus. You can't experience his salvation unless you follow these guidelines that are right there in the Old Testament scripture. Eat certain ways. Have your children circumcised. You need to be circumcised if you haven't been circumcised. And so what Galatians does is Paul is writing back to this church that has gotten this false teaching that said salvation is you believe in Jesus and trust him and you do these certain religious practices that are necessary if you really are going to experience salvation. And so what Paul does with Galatians is he writes to them. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. And, and read this part in light of what I just described as the occasion of the letter. I'm amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to change the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. Very strong words. For am I now trying to win the favor of people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. Paul says, I'm not interested in what other people say I ought to teach in terms of the gospel. What I'm interested in is what is the truth of the gospel that has been given to us by Christ. What is the truth of the gospel? And so, the occasion of this letter is for Paul to come against the false teaching that was going on in Galatia in the strongest terms, to say it is trust in Jesus alone that leads to salvation. So one of the things that we want to tune into with the letters is we want to understand the historical situation or occasion of the letter. Secondly, we want to understand the structure of the letter. Now, when we're reading the letters, It is going to be very, very important for us to understand a basic outline of the letter. Most of the letters develop in somewhat of a logical form. And so what we need as we're reading the letters is to have some sense of where the chapter we're reading fits in the overall development of the letter. For instance, with Galatians, we talked about just a minute ago. If you went to a Bible dictionary or a good study Bible, you would find a basic outline of Galatians. And probably that outline would tell you that chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 would be Paul's greeting to the church. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 10 that we read just a minute ago was Paul saying this new gospel is no gospel. And then what follows is uh, Paul's autobiography and his defense of his ministry. And that is found in chapter 1, verse 11, through chapter 2, verse 14. So if you just took a brief glance at that part of the outline, it would kind of clue you in to this part of the letter and how the different pieces fit together. And that's very helpful as you're reading through a book. Does that make sense to you? So we want to understand the structure a little bit. It will just help us as we're reading through these letters. All right, there's a third point about the letters. We want to move from culture to culture thoughtfully. Think of this as an adventure. Uh, We have to move from the specific cultural dynamics that we find in these letters to our culture. Because again, their culture was not the same as our culture. But when we're dealing with the New Testament letters, we want to tune into those cultural dynamics in the letters and understand them so that then we can find parallels in our situation and understand how we're supposed to apply the word to our lives. Now, as you think about the letters and the culture behind the letters, what are some of the cultural dynamics you can think of from the New Testament 
that seem a little odd to us or may, may not line up with how we do things in our culture? Can anyone think of an example or two? Um, one thing I can think of is when they talk about women wrapping their heads, okay. the type of clothing that they wear. All right, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about women, women having head coverings, and that could have been a, a literal article of clothing. It could have been women uh, having their hair up, um, and there are cultural reasons for that. If a woman had her hair down loose, that said things about her morality at points in that culture. But that is, that is an aspect of culture that we don't really understand until we get into it. What else? Can you think of something else? How about greeting each other with a holy kiss? Greeting each other with a holy kiss. Uh, definitely, that's an aspect of their culture that is not normal to us. Another uh, example would be 1 Corinthians 8. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 8, talks about food offered to idols and whether or not it's appropriate for a Christian to eat food that has been offered to idols. Now, Guys, how many of you have really struggled with this as a temptation this week? You know, whether you're going to eat food that has been offered to an idol, there actually are brothers and sisters of ours in other parts of the world who have to deal with this question because they're dealing with cultures where idolatry is still very much an issue in terms of uh, gods of stone and wood that people bring food to, right? So the question is, what is going on in that passage in 1 Corinthians 8? What Paul is saying is, um, you look at the situation of eating food off to idols, and Paul says, the reality is, we know that the gods that that food is offered to are not real gods. So a mature believer might have the freedom to say, you know, it's just food. But what Paul says, it's not that simple, because... A person who has come out of the pagan culture may be caused to stumble if they see you eating food that they know is food that has been offered to an idol. And if it causes that brother to stumble, then you should not use your freedom in a way that is harmful to that person's spiritual life. So uh, in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9, Paul says, Be careful that this right of yours in no ways becomes a stumbling block to the weak. Now, the question is, if that is the principle behind that passage, even though we don't deal with the issue of meat offered to idols, how then do we take that principle of stump, not causing someone to stumble and bring it over to our situation in the world today? Well, we need to think, are there situations where a person in the church might uh, exercise freedom that they have in Christ but do so in a way that could actually harm the spiritual life of a younger brother and sister because they just wouldn't understand. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when we're reading the letters, what we're going to do is we're going to um, address bringing the truth over into our cultural situation in a way that is in line with the truth being communicated. All right, I hope that was helpful for you and kind of gave you some some good, um, good ideas as we get into reading these letters to the churches, these letters in the New Testament. Uh, I want to mention that the first letter that we're going to start to study together is the book of Galatians. This was the first letter that Paul wrote. We're going to kind of work through these chronologically. So we're going to study them in kind of the timeline they were written in. Uh, this was the first letter that Paul wrote as we were studying the book of Acts, his missionary journeys and everything. This is the first letter that he wrote, and we're going to study that together starting uh, next Wednesday. So I hope you can join us for that. Hope you have a great week. And uh, again, let's just be faithful to what God is teaching us, what Jesus asks of us. Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's love our neighbors as ourselves. We'll see you next Wednesday.